For over 10 years, we at Climate One have been engaging policymakers, influencers, entrepreneurs, and activists and scientists in broad, respectful, candid conversations about everything climate. Food, energy, water, technology, transportation, housing. We've had huge success bringing together people who think they're on opposite sides of issues. When they sit down and have a candid conversation, they often find common ground and the basis for real solutions. We're emotional beings. Thoughtful, inclusive conversations create the conditions in which the changes we want to see become possible. So I want to hear from you. When you talk about climate, how do you talk about it? More importantly, what do you want to be talking about? With whom? Join the conversation. Even make your own video. Invite your friends to join you. Let's talk climate. I'm Greg Dalton, host of Climate One from the Commonwealth Club. Thanks for joining us for this discussion on how the corona crisis is changing the way the global economy is powered. If you're watching this in real time, we'd love to hear from you today. So please share your questions in the comments section on the live stream, or you can tweet them at us using our handle at Climate One. We'll use as many as we can during today's show. For future Climate One discussions on coronavirus, economic disruption, human behavior, and all things climate, sign up for our newsletter at climateone.org. You can also subscribe to our podcast that drops every Friday and is available wherever you get your pods. America's oil production has doubled over the past decade, and in February it reached its highest level ever, 13 million barrels a day. The United States had over time achieved a status once unthinkable, the world's largest oil producer. Weeks later, the global oil market suffered a historic crash. Prices even went negative for a day as the country ran out of places to store all the excess oil sloshing around in the oversaturated market. What does the crash mean for the future of oil and other fossil fuels? How are clean energy sources holding up during the COVID crisis? To discuss those questions and more, I'm pleased to welcome an all-star lineup. Jason Bardoff is founding director of the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University, my alma mater. He was a special assistant to President Obama on energy and climate change. Amy Harder covers energy and climate change insightfully for Axios and is a former reporter with the Wall Street Journal. Scott Jacobs is CEO and co-founder of Generate Capital and co-founded McKinsey and Company's clean tech practice. And Julia Piper is co-host and producer of the excellent Political Climate Podcast and is a contributing editor at Green Tech Media. Welcome to you all. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so Jason Bordoff, we are in an election year, and for, for as long as anyone can remember, American presidents are, are want cheap gas, cheap oil in an election year, because when oil prices are high, people get angry and cranky, as they did in, in the summer of, of 2008. Uh, now we have a president who's trying to talk up the price of oil. So explain to us what... prices. This one in particular, because he spent most of his presidency complaining about gasoline prices not being low enough and has a long history of attacking OPEC. And it comes back to what you said in the beginning. We've seen this unprecedented collapse in oil prices and in oil demand, obviously a result of the, putting the economy on hold to deal with the pandemic. 30 million barrels a day, that's 30 percent of global uh, oil demand, just wiped out in April, prices falling. And the United States you know, a decade ago was importing 60% of our oil. Now we are on the cusp of being a net oil uh, exporter. So we've basically stopped importing any oil at all. And what that means is an oil price spike or an oil price crash hits our economy differently today than it did before. It stay, still saves consumers money at the pump, although if you're not driving that much anyway, because people are on lockdown, it doesn't help them as much. But you're going to see more negative impacts in different states that produce oil for, for workers in those industries. And that'll be larger today than was the case 10 years ago. We'll get into that a little, a little more later, how oil is a bigger part of our domestic economy. Uh, Amy Harder, first, I, I want to ask you about a Bette Midler tweet that you told me about that, that kind of captures this moment. What did Bette Midler tweet? Yeah, well, I'm a Bette Midler fan, so I, I noticed her tweet. And the other day, she tweeted something along the lines of, I feel like I'm 16 again, grounded, and I can't go out and drive. And, you know, that's... Uh, kind of the public sentiment of the vast majority of the world, which is not the oil industries. All of us kind of find it a little funny that gasoline prices are going through the toilet and we're all mostly stuck at home. 
So uh, this is a historic collapse uh, in the industry, as Jason said, but most people don't really care. And, you know, the oil industry has never been a sector that exactly gendered, you know, goodwill and sympathy. Um, but uh, because of the incredible growth in oil production and gas over the last decade, it is a bigger part of our economy. But I, as long as we have people like Bette Midler tweeting jokes about the oil industry in crisis, I think it's going to be hard to really convey to people that this is a crisis, unlike, say, if gasoline and oil prices were, were skyrocketing. We're hearing that, that oil is a bigger part of the American, American economy, but Amy Harder, energy is a shrinking part of the S&P 500. The, the value of energy stocks is a smaller part of uh, Wall Street than it was, was 10 years ago. So help us understand how it's bigger and smaller at the same time. Yeah, well, I think an important part to understand about this corona crisis in particular is that the oil and gas industry was not doing very well before this crisis. I had done a, a column several weeks ago, I suppose, a couple of months ago at this point, and the headline was, we're producing more oil and gas than ever, and this industry stocks are tanking. And that was because they have basically drilled their way into financial hell, where they there's not a lot of, there's obviously zero coordination. So everybody's just producing more and more oil. And it's, there's just, there was too much oil in the world before demand dropped off a cliff. And so there's been a big financial headache within particularly producers in the United States and Texas and other places in the Permian Basin. And so that's why even though the industry is producing more than ever, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing well financially. And that's a disconnect that I think people don't quite understand. Another disconnect, we have people talk about energy. There's, there's, as you all know well, there's the liquid fuels transportation for cars and planes, and there's the, the, the power side, the electricity side. Uh, Scott Jacobs, Fatih Beryl, who's heads of the International Energy Association, said that only renewables are holding up well in this time. So let's move to the, the power side, the electricity side. How are renewables being affected by this? Well, in general, people still need their power. And whether they're at home or they're at work, they're consuming it. And as we all know, turning off your power is not really an option for, for businesses or consumers. Uh, and so paying your power bill is also something that people don't think of as an optional idea. Um, and we have continued to need power, whether or not we're driving around in cars, partly because we don't have enough electric cars that would be taking the power and propelling us with mobility. But uh, in general, what we're seeing is the power demand is still pretty high. And we've seen over the last 10 years, uh, an increasing amount of that power supplied by renewable electricity here in the US. Um, and that has, has no signs of abating. It is the cheapest form of power for two thirds of the world's population. And so the new capacity additions that we're seeing in terms of power sector growth is increasingly renewable power capacity and has already been the majority of new power capacity built over the last decade because of the economics. Julia Piper, I want to bring in the human connection here because often uh, we talk a lot about uh, energy. It gets very abstract. Uh, you, you've been re reporting on the connection between the African American communities and and COVID and, and energy. So tell us about that connection. Yeah, well, it's so easy and important to focus on the industries at play here. A lot of wealth is being moved around and lost and jobs, etc. But there's also a very human impact tied to this. Part of it's that I think the latest stat is around a million African Americans or people of color live near oil and gas facilities. And a Harvard study came out recently showing that people in those areas are disproportionately uh, subject or disproportionately vulnerable to upper respiratory illnesses like the coronavirus. And indeed, we are seeing death rates in those communities being much higher than in other areas. So there is a link here between oil and gas, what we're talking about from an industry perspective and how it plays out this coronavirus crisis and how it's affecting human lives right now. Jason Bordoff, you know, there's been uh, more people working in, in the industry, as you mentioned before. I've seen numbers of like 10 million people, direct and indirect. Um, and, and, and who's being hurt by this? I mean, obviously, energy is, is a boom and bust. This is nothing new, but it may be a different in terms of magnitude or how much it's hurting America. 
Yeah, it is different given that the United States, as you said in the beginning, is producing 13 million barrels a day. We produced about 5 million in 2008. So this is just a huge increase in employment uh, in the sector. And the scale, the magnitude, and the rapidity, as Amy said, of this, of this, of this collapse is really unprecedented. So to lose 30% of global oil demand that quickly, uh, it's normally you would see prices fall, people would stop investing, you start to have some declines in production. We don't have enough places physically to store all of this oil that was being produced. And so what we needed to do around the world was have prices go low enough that it gave people an incentive to just shut in production in the middle of a well producing, stop it. And, the, and, and if you look at the 10 million barrels a day of highest cost supply in the world, that's about 10%, there's 100 million consumed in the world, 40% of that is in North America. So you're seeing the United States and you're seeing Canada uh, get, get hit particularly hard. So you're gonna see US shale production, uh, which you said was 13 million, probably down something like 3 million by the end of the year. Hundreds of thousands of people in oil producing states, Oklahoma, Texas, North Dakota, uh, et cetera, uh, losing their job. And I think as Amy said a minute ago, one important point there was this was already a sector that had fallen out of disfavor because of political and social pressures around DSG concerns and because they weren't that profitable for some, many of them uh, recently anyway. Uh, I, I, shale after this will not look the same as shale before this. It will still be there. It will still be a large contributor to global oil supply. It will still grow every year, but you're may, talking maybe a couple hundred thousand barrels a day, not one or one and a half million barrels per day per year, uh, in part because you're going to see more difficulty accessing capital for uh, some production that probably wasn't economic in the first place. Amy Harder, does that, what does that mean for the kind of oil industry that the United States is gonna, gonna have? Is it gonna be smaller? Is it gonna be more, more consolidated with, with larger companies that buy up little ones during the, during the crisis? What's this, gonna, what's this gonna mean? Yeah, well, coronavirus for all industries really, it's less about one industry versus another and it's more about big versus little. So, you know, the big restaurants are doing fine and the little guys are struggling. The big airlines are doing better and the smaller airlines are doing worse. It's the very same, probably even to a more critical degree in the oil and gas industry. It's the smaller companies, more domestic focus that are probably going out of business. We've already had a few bankruptcies. And so I think overall, the industry from consumer's perspective won't change a lick. We'll go to the gasoline station and for the next at least six to nine months, prices at the pump will be quite cheap. Although um, in a few years time, they could be quite high because of this downturn. But behind the scenes, the industry will be more consolidated. And I think there's an open question. And I think you've seen some big global oil companies, particularly those in Europe like BP and Shell, really recommit their commitments to clean energy, a small portion of their, of their capital, but nonetheless, their goals on clean energy. And I think given how low oil prices have gone and the volatility that the industry has experienced, I think for some, it could change the industry to be more, even more open to uh, renewables, which although they may not have historically gotten the returns that oil and gas have, that it's far more stable, which says a lot. And I think that's one reason why investors are, have been pulling out of oil and gas. So Scott, can I have a little bit of a, sure. a doubt in here for a moment? There was some um, Apple data on mobile devices and, mo and who's moving on what mode of transit and car use is already spiking. So while I guess we have to separate, I guess, the consumer usage of the fuel and then the difficulty in the industry itself, because you could actually see a big rebound in the relatively near term of, of fossil fuel and gasoline use. And another stat that kind of shines a light on this is even amid shutting down global economies and the turmoil in the oil sector, uh, there was only an 8% or an expected 8% decline in emissions this year, according to the IEA. The world has to achieve an 8% emissions decline every year for the next decade, and even shutting down the economy didn't do that. So if your goal is decarbonization, fuel use and where that fuel comes from and the carbon intensity of it is going to be a continuing issue, even amid the current um, economic turmoil we're seeing right now. Scott Jacobs, I get chills when I hear numbers like that, that if we got to do this year after year after year, what is that? Can we do it? I, I just, I, I get you know, stopped in my tracks when I hear that, that, that magnitude screeching the global economy to a halt. And that's the kind of thing we need year after year. Yeah, it's a daunting challenge to think about solving climate change or bending the curve sufficiently to avoid catastrophic effects of it. I think we all know how energy plays one of many roles in that equation. 
And as much as we're making in a, a tremendous amount of progress with what people call the energy transition, where you're taking a dirty energy supply and replacing it with a clean energy supply, a lower carbon energy supply, it is not, we're not seeing the same progress in a lot of the other sources of emissions becoming decarbonized, whether it's the transportation sector we're talking about now, the agricultural sector we're talking about, or perhaps most importantly, industry and buildings, where we have not found better ways to decarbonize those um, emission sources uh, in the same way that we've found economically driven ways to decarbonize power, right? So the energy transition that most people talk about is really about power. And we're going from dirty sources of, of power generation like coal to cleaner sources like wind and solar. And that transition is underway and it's unequivocal and it's unabated because the economics drive it. But when you start thinking about thermal processes like cement production or aluminum, or steel, and you think about the building sector and the need to heat buildings, which we use natural gas primarily for, you start seeing just how daunting the problem is given the time scale that folks like the UN and others tell us we need to act against. Jason Bordoff, so that's what I hear there is that, you know, GDP equals energy equals emissions and we're not, just nothing structurally changing right now. People are going to hop back in their cars. We're going to go back to where we were and there's not really any climate progress coming out of this. Is that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about that. I mean, I don't disagree with anything that, that you said or that Julia said a minute ago. So I made the comment that I think shale will be taken down a peg, that that's not the same as saying we're making progress toward deep decarbonization in any sense of the word. I think, as, as I think Amy said, uh, there is a scenario, we don't know exactly how quickly the economy will recover. The International Energy Agency, the Energy Information Administration, both say oil demand will be back to their pre-COVID levels by pretty close to there by the end of the year. Maybe it takes longer than that if we have a second wave. Unfortunately, there's a possibility there. But within a year or two, I think we will be back pretty close uh, to where we were before. And as you just heard, you know, 4.2 billion people around the world are under lockdown. And this year, emissions will be down, according to the IEA, 5.5%. That's a pretty sobering reminder of how hard it is to decarbonize the world for all the reasons uh, that, that you just heard. And, and as, um, as Scott said, you know, the, history, the history of energy has actually not been one of transitions. It's been one of additions, where if you look at this on a scale of zero to 100%, we see these great shifts from wood to coal to oil to gas and now renewables. But if you look at it not as a share of the total, but in total BTUs, total metric total amount of energy, we just keep adding to the stack of meeting growing global energy demand with new and increasingly cleaner forms of energy. Uh, but meeting the climate challenge, because carbon math, you know, once a ton is up there, it's going to be up there for a long time, means not just meeting incremental growth in energy demand with new and cleaner sources of energy, but replacing the 80% of our energy mix that comes from hydrocarbons. And 80% hasn't changed in 30 years. It's been 80% for the last 30 years even as the amount of energy used, the denominator in that 80% has gotten bigger and bigger. Jason Bordoff is founding director of the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. We're also joined here at Climate One today by Amy Harder, energy and climate reporter with Axio, Scott Jacobs, CEO of Generate Capital, an investor in clean energy projects, and Julia Piper, co-host and producer of the Political Climate Podcast. I'm Greg Dalton. Chris Rawlings is founder and CEO of Veteran LED. He founded his lighting and energy management company in 2014 in Richmond, Virginia, where clients are commercial and industrial businesses. While most of his company's work has been put on hold due to the, to the COVID-19, he most his company mostly uses contractors, so his small seven-person staff hasn't faced any layoffs. And Rawlings told us he has a pretty optimistic take on the industry's future, which is directly linked to the after effects of the coronavirus pandemic. 2019 was a pretty steady year for us, so we were really looking at coming out of the gate very strong for 2020. For the most part, unfortunately, some of our projects or most of our projects fall in the, the capital expenditure realm of things. And right around the first week of April, most companies just completely halted CapEx projects. 
On the other hand, I think the health of the inhabitants of these buildings is obviously going to be a focal point moving forward because of the impact of COVID-19 and indoor air quality and just healthy environments, interior and exterior, that surround these buildings. That kind of falls into environmental and sustainability initiatives as well. I think you're going to see a lot of projects move forward now based on how comfortable they make that business owner or that building owner feel about having their customers and their employees return to that building and that building being in tip-top shape so they're minimally exposed to any future virus pandemics and i think people are gonna start looking at different technologies that are proven that have been out there a while and saying yeah we, we need to start adopting these technologies and start implementing these procedures because you can't put a cost on someone's life CEO of Veteran LED, a lighting and energy management company in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Scott Jacobs, you uh, work a lot or are very uh, optimistic about the, the path for electrifying buildings. And, and you were seemed to be nodding there when he was talking about uh, the way we approach buildings will be different after COVID. Comfort and can energy efficiency be part of that to electrify buildings, which we know is a big part of uh, that hasn't been tackled yet. Yeah, so first of all, I couldn't agree more with the comments that he was making about the motivations for building owners and occupiers uh, needing to respond to uh, the crisis with a healthier environment for employees and a healthier air quality, both inside and outside buildings. I, I do think a lot of what he's saying is that there is a growing attention to the concept of resilience. And we've used the word sustainability a lot in these circles when we talk about clean energy, when we talk about climate change, um, but really what we should be talking about is resilience. And whether it's COVID or whether it's climate change or whether it's macroeconomic shocks of other forms, companies are making better and better decisions about how to be resilient to those exogenous forces. And Clean energy is one such measure. Um, certainly, you can see the economics compelling people in addition to the desire to be resilient to these shocks when you think about something like LEDs. They are simply cheaper to use than the alternative. And while he's right that capital expenditures are often a challenging barrier to sale for things like LEDs and other energy efficiency measures, there are a lot of financial services players like Generate out there solving that problem. We take the capital risk and we take the operational risk so that customers don't have to. And there are a lot of ways that customers don't have to actually make a capital expenditure in order to get the benefits of either more resilience or cheaper energy or frankly, fewer emissions. Amy, that, that touches on the, the old idea of sort of, you know, is there, where's the money going to go after, after this? You know, we suddenly, uh, Washington, D.C., governments around the, the, the world are throwing trillions of dollars at coronavirus. How's that going to affect the ability to invest in, in cleaner energy in, in infrastructure? Is all the money going to have to come from companies because the, the public treasuries are all tapped out? Yeah, well, just a quick comment in response to to the discussion just now, I would have to disagree somewhat about, obviously the, the LED company wants to, you know, sell itself in this, what I'm calling this grave new world. But I just, I, I think it's just a bit a step too far removed to try to make the argument that buildings need to be more energy efficient in this new world. I mean, I think people, you know, companies might be looking to invest less in their buildings and more in telework opportunities or, you know, new desks that allow social distancing. I just, I just think it's, it's important to remember those of us who live and breathe the energy and climate space to remember that a lot of times, most of the time, and particularly this mo moment in time, the, the public is just not thinking about these issues. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. And so, so I just, I think it's, 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 it's a hard connection to make, I think, to talk about 
ways to make commercial buildings more energy efficient when people might be going to them less and there might be less of a reason to invest in that space. Um, and then going to your, to your question uh, about uh, where the investment overall could come, I think in the next six to nine months, it's, there's going to be a question mark in terms of whether or not uh, the US Congress and other countries around the world really try to put a green veneer and injection, inject some green um, spending into their stimulus plans. I tend to think in the short term, um, at least as long as President Trump is in the White House, that that remains quite unlikely. And I think, um, and even after that, let's say Joe Biden wins. I mean, by January 2021, hopefully the economy is doing better by then and all the big stimulus packages are over by then. But that all being said, I mean, I think uh, to, to something that was said earlier, I mean, the IEA notes that renewable energy is actually the one type of energy that's expected to grow a little bit still this year. And that's because unlike a decade ago in the economic recession of 2008 and nine, there is a incredible growth in the renewable energy industry. And now that it exists all over the world, it's going to be the plant that stays running when you know, countries and companies can shut down coal and natural gas plants. So I think that's a huge advantage to renewable energy. And I think that that's one reason why you'll continue to see investment in that space, even as the economy craters. Jason Bordoff, how has this changed the domestic politics? You know, there's the, the it, particularly in the, in the U.S. Senate with, with uh, states, there's, we've always had energy exporting states, but now they, do they have more muscle? And how does that connect to the international scene where you have senators trying to connect with Saudi Arabia, et cetera, because, because of what's happening globally? Yeah, well, you certainly see more states and a larger share of the economies in those states that feels pain when we see an oil collapse uh, like this, which is why many senators, Texas, Oklahoma, North Dakota, Alaska, put a lot of pressure, and, and President Trump put a lot of pressure on particularly Saudi Arabia and Russia to try to do what they could, which was something, but not enough, to try to uh, deal with this oil, oil, oil price collapse. Um, you also have more and more states, as Scott and, other, and others know really well, that have a stake in renewable energy as well now too, including in red states. And so I just want to make one, you know, one observation on, on the point that was just raised and, and what Amy said about the IEA showing renewables will, do, uh, will actually grow this year. Partly that's because of how cheap they've become. It's also because they get policy support. They became that cheap because of policy support, and they're first in the dispatch because usually you have policy that requires that. And so I think there are some ways in which you could see behavioral changes. People enjoy working remotely, or maybe they want to be more energy efficient. That could come out of COVID-19. That could be positive. You could see stimulus or some other economic recovery that starts to address climate change. But we're not going to get anywhere close to the kind of what we just said we need to see, 8% declines year on year, taking one and a half or two degree warming seriously without much stronger policy that changes the incentives that businesses have and individuals have for how they produce and consume energy. And what I'm worried about is that history suggests that when economies are struggling and people feel pinched in their pocket, the ambition of environmental policy can often wane. And climate, we all know more than almost any other problem, requires global cooperation to solve because it is fundamentally a you know, collective action free rider problem. It doesn't matter where a ton of CO2 comes from. And uh, unfortunately, we've already seen a retreat from global cooperation, and that may get worse after this pandemic as countries isolate themselves and put up walls more. I'm worried about that. Julia Piper, you host the Political Climate Podcast. Uh, people often say there's there's plenty of supply, policy supply. There's plenty of policies out there. There's What is in short supply is the political will to enact them and move them forward. How do you see this crisis changing the politics of clean and brown energy in, in the United States? Well, I think the jobs is really where the political discussion lies in any meaningful way. And in March alone, the stats were that over 100,000 people lost their jobs in clean energy. Most of that's in efficiency. People can't get into homes and buildings, but 16,000 were in wind and solar. And that's just in the month of March alone. As far as I know, we don't have the numbers for April just yet. But that's across the nation. That affects every representative's district. So I do see there being some interest in getting some policy support on that front. As far as I know, infrastructure has been moved to the back seat in Congress right now. Discussion of including that in a stimulus is, is not front of mind for anyone, even though President Trump has actually expressed interest in it, and Democrats as well. Uh, Mitch McConnell's not so much. Uh, and then there, you know, it's interesting, there was some data that's coming out or just came out from Data for Progress, 
And it's showed that there is broad support across the country for things like supporting sustainable small farmers, things that are not top of mind for me usually, but that polls really high. Things like creating um, a national climate core to put people to work planting trees. Everyone remembers this planting millions and billions of trees concept. It actually polls quite well. And it may not solve all of our climate issues, but it could put people back to work. So what will be interesting is whether anyone really has the appetite to take on those quirky and new and different kinds of policies are not traditionally what we're used to. More likely, we'll have a discussion around clean energy tax credits, whether or not that gets back on the table as part of a, a package to come. Uh, but I will note that there's something like $40 billion, I think, sitting in the Department of Energy right now that's not being spent that could be used to support clean technologies of various kinds, could be used to put people back to work under various authorities. So that could be something that the government could look at without even Congress's input. Scott Jacobs, though, there's a particular uh, orientation in this administration for that Title VII money, that $40 billion, uh, right? Tell us about that. Yeah, my understanding is that most of it is for clean coal and nuclear build out. And unfortunately, you know, it still depends on other actors being rational uh, uh, and other actors are rational and are not choosing to deploy technologies that make no economic sense like clean coal currently and like some of the advanced nuclear for which that money has been earmarked. You know, at the end of the day, we still have to go back to the economic proposition to the customer and deliver to the customer the most affordable, reliable energy. And uh, the things that this administration has chosen to embrace, like coal, do not offer the most affordable, reliable electricity anymore. They once did, but they do not any longer. And there's uh, no surprise as a result that even since 2016, when this administration came into the office, we've seen We've seen coal power generation drop by 30 to 50%, depending on sort of what time of year or what uh, geography you're talking about. It's been completely displaced half by, um, by gas and half by renewables. And for the same reason in both cases, they're cheaper. We're gonna to go to our, our lightning round with our guests here today, Climate One, uh, starting with true or false questions and then associations. So first true or false, Scott Jacobs, EV sales in the United States dropped in 2019. Uh, false. Mm, I, think they, I think they, well, what I saw is they dropped in 2019, although they almost doubled in 18 from, from the year before. Um, true or false, who is that? Is Marnov? Is that's not me? Is it? Um, true or false? Jason Bordoff, your institute at Columbia received significant funding from fossil fuel interests. Uh, we're funded through Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, and all the donors are on their website. That includes energy companies. Yep, and it's just uh, turn that right back on Climate One. We have about uh, two percent in fiscal twenty twenty from from one oil company. Um, Julia Piper, true or false, you will ride the Los Angeles right light rail again this year. Oh, 100% true. Just looked at moving right next to it. <laughs> uh, Jason Brod Bordoff, true or false, you will ride the New York subway again this year. I think that's true. Uh, true or false, Amy Harder, you are desperately waiting for olive oil to go under $2 a barrel. I do need more olive oil. And that was another joke I saw on Twitter. Uh, when oil prices tanked, somebody tweeted, let me know when olive oil is under $2 a barrel. Right. I, I pay good money for good olive oil. And yeah. I don't pay good money for good oil because I don't have a crop. <laughs> uh, to, also for Amy, uh, European, true or false, European oil companies are decarbonizing slower than American oil companies. That is false because they're going faster. Faster. Um, Jason Bordoff, uh, when true or false, when creating Columbia Energy Exchange podcast, you found inspiration from the Climate One podcast. That's true. You know, I'm a regular listener, especially when I'm cycling, and uh, and and that's absolutely true. Cycling uh, safely, I hope. Uh, <laughs> uh, Julia Piper, true or false, when creating the Political Climate podcast, you also found inspiration from the Climate One podcast. Absolutely. Took inspiration from anyone. It's a, it's a crowded space and Jason's podcast as well. Uh, everyone. And we tried to add a bipartisan element to it and have a new twist. And it's so great to see everyone really, you know, adding to this conversation. True, true or false, uh, Scott Jacobs, your wife is expecting a baby any day now. 
12 days away from the due date indeed true congratulations what a time uh association i'm just going to ask you something to mention something and ask you for your the first thing that comes to mind just one sentence one word or phrase that comes to mind when i say this thing so jason bordoff what comes to mind when i say joe biden's proposal for a cabinet level climate secretary uh, i think we need to elevate uh climate through in the white house uh, and in the cabinet different ways to do that but we definitely need to do that yeah, some concern about what that would, you know, cast shade on the EPA. Uh, Amy Harder, what comes to mind when I mention oil company pleas to have the COVID-19 pandemic declared an act of God so they can get out of contracts? Not surprising that they would try to do that, but seems unlikely to succeed. Uh, Julia Piper, what comes to mind when I mention Duke Energy's plan to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, Duke Energy being... America's largest electric utility. If I'm not mistaken, it involves a fair amount of offsets or technology. It still has a fair amount of fossil fuels in the portfolio. So uh, we've yet to see how they're gonna get there. And I would say the same with Dominion in Virginia in light of really positive new co news coming out of there, but still a piece of that natural gas puzzle that they uh, can't quite get to meet their 100% requirement. Lots of, uh, yeah, uh, lofty goals being project, uh, made for 2050 when the current leaders won't be around. Uh, Scott Jacobs, what comes to mind when I say General Motors siding with the Trump administration against California's auto fuel efficiency standards? Good luck in the Supreme Court. <laughs> uh, Amy Harder, what comes to mind when I say cities that are banning cars on some streets and expanding sidewalks and bike lanes during the COVID-19 shutdown? It's really nice. As a, as a new cyclist myself uh, here in Seattle, I have a bum foot, uh, so I can't do what I love to do, which is running. So I've been cycling places. It's been really nice not to have cars around. But I think in the US in particular, that seems a temporary phenomenon. In Europe, I could see it lasting more permanently. Last question, Julia Piper, what comes to mind when I mention some good news with John Krasinski? Oh, so much fun. Made me smile. <laughs> Everyone uh, should watch it. <laughs> as everyone long as they take away from their podcast listening. <laughs> everyone should watch it. It's fabulous. So well, thanks for getting through the uh, the lightning round. Um, we have a question from Joshua Rhodes on YouTube. How will the reduction of associated natural gas from oil production impact the price of gas and electricity and then demand for renewables? We'd like to unpack that. Um, Jason Bordoff, you know, the uh, talking about natural gas associated and then its impact on renewables. Yeah, that 20% of US gas supply comes as a byproduct of producing oil. So when you see a collapse in oil production, I mentioned a minute ago, we might see something like 3 million barrels a day, you're going to get less gas. Consequence of less gas supply means higher gas prices. And you already see that in the futures curve, the projections for natural gas for next year are higher as a result of, uh, of COVID-19. Uh, so, so that I, I, that's going to impact the competitiveness of, of gas, and, and uh, to the extent gas is a little more expensive, you're going to see other types of energy renewables, possibly coal, uh, compete uh, a little more more favorably. Let's go outside the United States. Europe's Green Deal was launched shortly before the the uh, outbreak of the COVID pandemic. It's an ambitious plan to reshape agriculture, energy, uh, transport, you know, go toward uh, climate neutral in 2050. Uh, Scott Jacobs, is, you know, is this wishful thinking by some environment ministers that don't really hold the core of power in their countries, or is this going to going to really happen, especially with the fiscal stress of COVID now? I mean, it's a great question, and it's always important to look outside the U.S. for what other folks are doing when it comes to these climate questions. And I think what we've seen for the last 10 or so years is that in the U.S., we've polarized these questions, politicized these questions. The rest of the world has not. China thinks about it as an industrial policy question, and they think about it as a survival question. And in Europe, you've seen continued interventions to make their economy greener, and many of the incentives that they're thinking about putting in place in order to boost a recovery are tied to the greenness of the activity that is being um, you know, incentivized. So I, I think what we have in Europe is a very different political environment. And I don't worry about um, the fantasy, as you may have described it, for these environmental ministers. I think execution is still always a challenge everywhere. And having the right incentives and the right mix of policy support versus you know, private sector activity is, is always a challenging question confront. But in Europe, 
climate change, climate mitigation, clean energy, those are not political questions. They are scientific questions. They are economics questions. They are about the long-term survival of humanity and a public health question. And so I actually am very optimistic that the Europeans are gonna to continue to incentivize green ways of uh, recovering. Can I just add, I spoke to um, the EU ambassador to the United States in recent days, and he underscored that they are committed. So they are publicly being proactive in their communication, saying this wasn't just a passing thing. We've actually integrated, as Scott mentioned, into our recovery plan, specifically grid digitization as well. Like they are getting specific and technical on how they want to see this stimulus work on the green front. Uh, Julia Piper, you went to India recently, uh, and uh, I follow this uh, climate action tracker that comes out of the Potsdam Institute, and India and Costa Rica are among the few companies that are on a trajectory for a two degree Celsius and post-industrial warming. Uh, EU and Brazil are on a three degree track, and China four degree, and US and Russia and Saudi Arabia e even worse. So India is, is a country that seems closer, relatively close to its Paris commitments. How is that going to be affected by this crisis? Yeah, uh, really good question. Um, so like the global renewable energy sector, there are supply chain, supply chain disruptions, and then there's just social distancing and issues that developers have and how they're going to build projects. So there's definitely a delay in India's clean energy transition, which is crucial if the, goal, if the globe wants to meet any of its climate goals. India does rely disproportionately on coal today, 70 upwards of 70%, maybe 90%, excuse me, of their power comes from coal. Uh, so there will be a delay in the transition. I went there thinking that it would be sort of a setback story at the end of the year. The, the government had allowed foreign investment into the coal mines there, which looked like an effort to shore up the industry. Flash forward a couple of months later, obviously we're also amid coronavirus. There's been no interest from foreign investors to invest in Indian coal mines. So the government had to kind of say, okay, maybe this is not, not gonna be as easy to support this sector as we thought. Meanwhile, renewable energy auction bids keep coming in lower and lower. SoftBank and others just won some showing how the cost declines are going. And then you saw the Modi government actually declare renewable energy a must run resource. It's an essential service even now amid coronavirus. So development is continuing in that country. and. Uh, yeah, we'll see what happens in future coal, but right now coal is being backed off the system as cheaper renewables are being prioritized on the grid in India. So I think there's a lot of effort, a lot of, there's historically, I think, a narrative around these countries moving slowly. I do think having reported on it, thinking there was a negative story, it is actually true that India is moving quite fast and doing quite a good job, even amid this coronavirus crisis and setting up itself policy-wise for success on that front. They might meet their 175 gigawatt renewable energy target in 2022 a little late, but they've, they're over 100 gigawatts in the pipeline now and they could get there. Jason Bordoff, you wrote a piece recently about how Saudi Arabia could be a surprise winner from all of this, emerge stronger economically, politically. Uh, why do you think that? Well, it comes back to the point I think Amy mentioned uh, earlier on, which is that boom could follow bust. I mean, that's the history of the oil industry. So relative to a lot of other petro states, Nigeria, Iraq, Venezuela, um, they are in a better fiscal position to make it through a year or two of low oil prices. And if in fact we do see demand recover, quickly, and we've heard some view on this so far that that may be the case, you see, as I mentioned, shale falling, and it will come back, but not to the same extent. You have that a lot of oil supply being shut in around the world. The estimates I've seen around 4 million barrels a day might be semi-permanently damaged, meaning it never comes back, or it takes a lot of time and a lot of money to bring that supply back. All the large companies, Chevron, Exxon, et cetera, have slashed their capital, capital uh, expenditure budgets. So if if supply lags demand, then we could see a price run up in the years ahead, which could work to the fiscal advantage of some of the large uh, oil producers. And then finally, it was kind of, you know, we mentioned a minute ago how the pre President Trump was so uh, eager to see oil prices get some support. And there were lots of ideas thrown out about how he could do that. We could reconstitute the Texas Railroad Commission, which last put quotas in place a half century ago, or we could have import tariffs on, on oil. In the end, none of those things proved possible, really the only tool we had at our disposal was reaching out to Riyadh and to Moscow as well, and trying through pushing and cajoling and, and diplomacy to say, can you try to do something about this? And I think that's an re important reminder that no matter how much oil we produce at home and whether we're importing or not, we are still vulnerable to the global oil markets and, uh, and have to turn to OPEC to do something if we don't like oil prices being too high or too low. And if we wanna change that and develop some measure of independence, 
we need to stop using so much oil in the first place, which of course we have to do for climate as well. So the uh, energy dominance hasn't worked. And Jason, do you think we're gonna be back to, to be more uh, import reliant in the future? I do. I think we were just on the cusp of being a net oil exporter. We import a lot and we export a lot, but on a net basis, it was about zero before this. We're going to see oil demand fall, oil production in the U.S. fall several million barrels a day. Once the prices recover, it'll start growing again. But I do think demand is probably going to recover faster than supply. So we will still be a net importer for, for a while. Amy Harder, you've talked about how the you know the bust leads to the you've talked about how the bust leads to uh, the future boom. Uh, hearing Jason talk about keeping oil on the ground, shutting it in, um, you know, climate activists might be say, "Great, you know, that's what people, uh, Bill McKibben and others would say. We have to keep it in the ground. That's where it should stay." Uh, what's what's uh, what's wrong with that thinking? Or do, do you agree that like, well, shutting in wells, yes, that's what people want. Keep the tar sands in the ground because that's where it needs to stay. We can't burn it and maintain civilization. Yeah, it's sort of ironic, I guess, to say that, you know, we've gone, this situation, the world that we're in has gotten so crazy that, you know, the Trump administration's potential positions are now Bill McKibben's positions in, in the very narrow sense that, you know, there were some considerations in the administration to pay companies to keep their oil in the ground. And it's, it's a little ironic for somebody, who, you know, who's been covering both of these very um, polarizing sides of this debate. For quite some time, I think ultimately, when it comes to the climate activism of this, uh, it's it's missing the point. And the analogy I use is, it's like, well, if you wanted to lose weight, why don't you just stop eating food? It's like, well, of course we can't just stop eating food. Like we need food for energy and to do things. The way to sustainably lose weight is to gradually eat healthier food and fewer calories. In the same vein, the the way to reduce emissions and get off fossil fuels is to gradually reduce them and increase renewables. And so this whole experience, this whole tragic crisis of the coronavirus is just showing to me, and going back to what Julia said about um, what this shows about the, the drastic drop in emissions is just an extreme example of how hard it is to decarbonize the world, which is something I know Jason has said as well. So I think, although this seems like a very brief moment for climate activists to cheer, uh, it's, it's, it's not a sign of anything in the long term. In fact, we've already seen oil companies' stocks rise, prices are going up in a really weird, twisted way. It's, it's almost like the uh, coronavirus could actually, as Jason said in a chat he and I had the other day, this could actually clear out some of the weaker links in the oil, oil industry and make the oil industry stronger and therefore last longer after this. Do you think, you know, this, a lot of the large oil companies, Shell and BP, others say that they need policy to achieve their, their stated goals. But BP, Shell, now Total has said we want to have a, you know, decarbonize or net zero, various kind of future. Are they putting their policy muscle where their mouth is on that? Are they lobbying? You know, only BP has left the, left the American Petroleum Institute. Um, are, they, are they advocating for the policy that they say they need to meet their own goals? Well, I actually don't think any big oil company has left API. Um, I think BP and Shell and Total have left the American fuel petrochemical okay. makers. Uh, uh, right, they stay in API. It. Right, okay. Right. Thanks. So API is definitely uh, likely going to keep all of its members from a climate perspective. I don't see any of them defecting because of that. Um, I do think for now, it's mostly rhetoric and not that much lobbying action. A lot of these companies, including ExxonMobil, have actually put a uh, million or two dollars into a lobbying campaign to get a carbon tax um, through Congress. That whole campaign has really um, got put on the back burner um, given the COVID crisis. I think what I'm going to be looking for is in a crisis moment like what we're in now, Will these oil companies choose to prioritize pushing action on climate change? Because when you go to Congress, when a, when a company lobbies Congress, there's always a litany of things that they need to talk to any member of Congress or the administration about. So maybe it's the trade battles, maybe it's ethanol wars. And usually climate change, sure, BP and Shell and Exxon say they support a carbon tax, but do they really uh, prioritize it when they go knocking on the doors? And so far the answer has been no. And I think as we go through this crisis and recovery mode, will they knock on doors to ask for a green recovery? 
So far, I haven't seen it. And that's something that I'll be asking as well. I think we also have to note that there have been efforts as those national ones happen about a carbon pricing scheme. Oil companies have lobbied in other states against carbon pricing, like in Washington state. Um, and we should also note that these uh, proposals often include something else like um, removal from or a reduction in the risk of, of future regulation. And so it's a trade off. And so a business person is always going to take a known risk of a market based pricing scheme over some future regulation that they don't know what impact it's going to have on their business. So if they could secure that win, they might be appealing. And there's a valid discussion to be had there. But I just want to note, it's not usually just a carbon pricing uh, opportunity on its own that these oil companies are supporting. Which leads to a question we have from YouTube. Uh, Colleen Cradell asks, in the US, the response to COVID-19 has been largely led by governors. What prospects are there for state leadership on climate change coming out of this crisis? I'd like to, Jason Borup, I see you nodding there. Uh, yeah, Scott should comment on it too. I mean, I think there's a huge opportunity there and we're already seeing it. We're seeing it obviously in California, my own state of New York. Uh, states are, are stepping forward and putting in place in some states, not all, pretty uh, strong measures to help support clean energy, set ambitious goals by which they need to decarbonize. We need a lot more of that. The challenge is, you know, it's we, we mentioned a minute ago how important it is to coordinate at the multinational level because emissions can leak into other uh, countries and it doesn't matter where a ton of CO2 comes from, that's even harder at the state level. So I think um, we do, there's some emissions that states and cities have control over. I mean, Scott, we, we talked about in the video you showed, you know, reducing emissions in buildings. I think it's great if people try to take the leadership to do that, but you need policy to do that. You need building standards, you need a price on carbon, you need something else. So sometimes states and cities are a good place to do that, but there are a lot of things that really you need federal, if not global, coordinated action to address. Scott Jacobs. Yeah, while I agree that global coordination is really the only way we're going to get the scale of the solution to meet the scale of the problem, I don't think there's anything particularly unique about the COVID-induced environment about how states step up and lead, especially when it comes to energy policy. We have seen for the last 15 years states stepping up and leading and their policies driving much more behavior change investment change and decarbonization than anything at the federal level. And that continues to be the case today. It will be likely the case post COVID. You know, energy, especially from an electricity standpoint is regulated at a local level. Um, you know, transportation fuels, different story. Uh, building standards, both, right? We saw California take a very progressive building standard to all new buildings that need to be now net zero and net zero carbon. Um, start, you know, starting January 1st of this year. That's far and away more aggressive than anything we ever heard about the even Obama administration trying to do at a federal level. So it's a mix of local, state, federal, and international policies that will help us move forward. But it's also important to remember that the fundamental economics of the decarbonized stuff is increasingly attractive. It is already better in many cases than the carbonized stuff. And the bigger challenge, which I think we all haven't really addressed, but we're talking about uh, in, in certain ways, is the stock, the actual capital stock of the world and the stock of carbon already in the atmosphere. Those are the issues. It's not really what we do in 2021 with new energy capacity builds or new regulations on farming or food production or any of that. It's what do we do with all this stuff that's already here, both in the atmosphere and in the built environment and infrastructure, that's much harder to solve and much bigger problem for climate change. But, but if I could just say, tell me if you agree, Scott, it is true that clean energy wins economically in the power sector. And electricity right. is about 20% of global final energy demand. So there's a lot of stuff beyond electricity and we can electrify some of that, not right. gonna electrify all of it, because uh, there are things that are hard to electrify. And so we're going to need a pretty broad set of solutions, which might include hydrogen, and carbon capture, and direct air capture, and various other things uh, to try to capture all the rest. Absolutely. And Wood McKenzie actually notes, I think, in their latest analysis that EV sales this year, I believe, will be down 43% because of these disruptions to supply chains and just consumer appetite, et cetera, there will be a hit to that segment. So there'll be even a building back up to the trajectory that these technologies had before. 
Um, and then there's another thing I love that I think Amy wrote was about you have your pasta and your salad on the side. And so far we've been in this additive situation. We're just adding salad. But we haven't really taken away our pasta portion yet. Uh, so I think that's just an awesome way of framing it. So hat tip to you, Amy. I, I've, I've had to borrow that a few times. <laughs> well, that's what I do when I try to be healthy. I'm like, I'm just going to add a salad on top of this big yeah. pile, pile of pasta and then I'm going to be healthier. It's like, well, not really. The purpose is to to lose weight or to transition. I need to take off a quarter of the pasta and add, you know, half a salad. Adding kale onto coal. Uh, we have a question from Richard Rollins. With COVID-19, we've seen how bold early action helped minimize impact. How can this message be transferred to our climate crisis? We've done so much so fast, spent a ton of money. Scott Jacobs, trillions of someone, you know, when the Democratic candidates came out with their plans, <gasps> trillion dollars, oh my gosh, the horror of that. And now we're just throwing trillions around like gumballs. Yeah, I mean, having worked with the uh, Obama administration on the transition team, you know, I remember how fraught a trillion dollar number to recover from the global financial crisis was in terms of a political debate. And, you know, we had the very strong influence of the Tea Party at the time, trying to uh, reduce government budgets altogether. And it's remarkable that it, in the Republican led administration and Republican led Senate, you know, two, three trillion dollars, no problem. Um, and so it's an interesting political dynamic. And I, you know, I, I'm in the business world very deliberately. So I try to avoid some of those political debates and just do what makes sense for customers and for other stakeholders that we try to deal with. Another question, uh, Gerald Bernstein asks about anyone see a prospect for a carbon tax? This would enhance the efficiency efforts, but for economic reasons, not employee health. Julia Piper, you cover the politics, any appetite? Mm -hmm. Um, look, some of the recent data I've shown again coming from, I think it was data for progress, showed that the appetite is actually switching to regulation. They, there's some tr distrust growing around market-based schemes, according to the, that polling. So uh, that's different, though, from what would actually happen on, on Capitol Hill. I think there's more understanding of what that policy solution would look like. I don't actually think it's going to get much traction immediately. Um, the Republican on our show, Shane Skelton, uh, who joins us pretty much every week, he was saying an interesting point that the Republicans who support this kind of solution, Francis Rooney, um, Carlos Corbello in Florida, uh, Corbello, for instance, has lost his election. And he says part of the problem is that Republicans who support this kind of solution don't get any support from the, from the right, from the established Republican group, which is fair. They have a more of an evolution that would need to happen there. But they don't get support from environmental groups either. So they are left with no home. And so we wonder why these things can't pass. And so again, I'm kind of paraphrasing Shane here, but he would say that if you want to see bipartisan action, like getting a, a possible solution like a carbon tax through, you got to support those eco-friendly Republicans. So I'll, I'll throw that out there to stir the pot a little bit, but that would be something that I think he'd want to point to here. I think Just to chime in, I, yeah, I, I, I don't see a carbon tax anytime soon. Even Joe Biden, you know, the Democrats nominee for president, he has not um, explicitly said he supports a carbon tax. And so even House Democrats in their big bill, it doesn't have a carbon tax. So even though economists can bang their heads on the wall, like screaming it from the rooftops, it just doesn't have the political, the political support. And I don't see that ending at all. I think in a recession, it, the, the concerns and the perception, sometimes real, sometimes not, of increasing energy prices, uh, you know, carbon taxes are regressive. Uh, I think that will only become more salient and more difficult to get through Congress, even though it was already difficult to begin with. So how do we see this 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 playing out? Where you know we've got a few months till the election. It's kind of hard to, re to <laughs> remember that there's this election campaign going on. There's primaries happening that are like kind of non-events, right? And among everything else, and Amy, uh, you know, COVID has you know pushed everything, including climate out of the media. How do you see this, this playing through the, you used to cover the Wall Street Journal in, in Washington, this playing through the political process, does the, you know, does climate get pushed aside, pushed down the road? Does it even register? I remember just a few months ago, there were all these climate town halls and climate was more front and center in the debate and that's just gone poof. It really has. Uh, I, I certainly think climate change as a topic will, has already gone to the back burner. The way that I've described it is that pre-COVID, climate change had really reached a high watermark, no pun intended, although it's kind of funny that it came up that way in my writing. 
that it wasn't the most important topic to voters all around the country, but it had become the most, had become, had taken on the mo most importance than it ever has in terms of our political system over the last couple of decades. And so you were seeing pockets of it, particularly in the Democratic Party, where it was a top issue along with healthcare. I think now we're, you're going to see healthcare in the economy, healthcare in the economy. And I think, um, but climate change was never going to be a real big topic between Trump and whoever the nominee was ever going to be. Um, I can already foresee how it will go in the debates. Uh, Biden will say that Trump ignores science, both on COVID and climate change. And Trump will say Biden wants to kill the economy with the Green New Deal. And that's pretty much what we can expect from climate change on the campaign trail. That all being said, there's huge implications for climate change with the outcome of this election, to state the obvious. I mean, Biden, even if he can't get anything through Congress, he will make sweeping changes at the executive level. And the pendulum that Washington has swinging back and forth on regulations will just swing far back to the left where it was in the Obama years. And so I do think there'll be significant impacts for climate change in this election, but I don't foresee it being a big talking point. I think, I think the bigger question, if I may, is, is what would allow us to return to the world we had pre-2008 where the word conservative and the word conservation had as much in common as they actually have in common. You know, Teddy Roosevelt was the leading light in environmental policy and was a conservative. Uh, most of the environmental foundation backers financially vote Republican. It is really remarkable to me that we had a bipartisan topic and a bipartisan bill sponsored by the Republican nominee in 2008 for carbon pricing and climate change mitigation. And here we are 12 years later where the issue has been successfully polarized and politicized by certain forces. The question is, when can we actually get back to a place where we recognize long-term existential threats to all people, no matter how they vote. And I'd love to see that day come again in my lifetime. It is an imperative for us as a country to get back to that point. Yeah, I think the people element is so important there. Yeah, um, gosh, a dog barked and I lost my thought. <laughs> but uh, I guess I'll leave it there. But I think getting, getting back, oh, I guess I was gonna just say on the jobs front, um, the Senate had a bill uh, that had a lot of goodies in there for clean energy, energy storage, and other kinds of technologies, and it had bipartisan support, but that ultimately lost steam last session. Maybe climate doesn't have any future in the immediate future in Congress, but clean energy and energy efficiency could. Pollution regulations could. And, you know, we started at the beginning talking about uh, the impact to people of color and, and lower income groups. I think there could be a real push around improving the health of those communities that could have implications for clean energy. Also on India, I mentioned, they, they would point to the international community being pretty much absent as countries like India forge ahead. The Green Climate Fund, for instance, is woefully underfunded. If Biden wins, you could see money coming back into initiatives like that. So maybe we don't get this grand sweeping policy, a Green New Deal, stuff that like garners a lot of headlines, but there could be more targeted pieces of, of policy that do get through, potentially even under a Trump administration, if something like that Senate bill comes back into play. So I just wanted to add a little more, more nuance there that uh, we like to talk about climate, but it is different from clean energy and there could be some real traction on that front that's, that's meaningful. Jason Bordoff, Joe Biden seems to be fairly, you know, cautious, certainly compared to he's this, you know, center lane candidate. As someone who worked in the Obama-Biden administration, do you think he's being bold enough to address the climate um, concern as we know it? Well, I think if you look at his plans, he has ambitious targets for what he's going to spend on clean energy, what he's going, how, how quickly he plans to try to reach uh, net zero uh, emissions. But he also, I think, has a lot of details in his plans about what that looks like, because I think solving climate is not just about how much money you spend, but how you put in place a host of policies to try to drive toward more rapid decarbonization. And, uh, you know, I think the, I take Amy's point that it's not going to have the same urgency as, say, the economy uh, or, or public health, but it is, it is striking how different this election is than previous elections, that almost every time the vice president speaks, 
he is talking about climate as one of his top priorities. And that's because it has become a more urgent concern for many voters, particularly younger voters, and because some of his opponents, like Bernie Sanders and others, uh, you know, elevated it uh, on the agenda. And, and I think when Sanders endorsed Biden, you know, uh, Biden sort of pointed that out and, and credited him with helping to do that. I think in order to get the kind of action we need, what Scott said a minute ago is super important. It's worth remembering this just coming on the heels of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. What we had in 1970, it was not partisan. It, it was not divisions among de demographic uh, parts of, of the country. It was the whole country coming together and saying, we just can't live like this anymore. We can't have this level of smog. We can't have do not swim or drink the water signs and, and because we're just discharging pollution into the water. Uh, Cuyahoga River catching on fire and Santa Barbara oil spill and, and all the other kind of you know, fa famous events. Um, it was not partisan. It was the whole country having a level of concern and urgency that we came together. And while climate has sharply risen on the agenda and how seriously people take it and how much concern there is about it, uh, which is great, we're, we're not there yet. We're not, st we're not at the level yet where the whole country across demographics, across parties recognizes the urgency of this. And that's gonna be important to change if we don't just get sort of incremental progress and Julia just described some ways we might, but the sort of scale and ambition of policy we need to meet deep decarbonization goals. I think it's helpful to, to compare just really quickly to, to COVID. I mean, we're already seeing partisan divisions on COVID and denial of the science when it comes to COVID. And I think if, if, if the country, if, the, if different political parties can't agree on something as urgent as a public health crisis where people could be dead in two weeks, I don't see how that bodes well at all for broad political consensus on climate change. So I tend to think that any big solution will have to be more of an inside baseball game without worrying too much about most Republicans in Congress or most Republican voters in the US given just the propensity of the United States to polarize everything it touches. I used to have uh, been both persuaded by people that any political compromise needed to be bipartisan because Obamacare wasn't and look how it was attacked. To be, to, to, climate is going to be so long term that anything would have to be bipartisan to endure as California has over the cross of changing power between parties. California has kept sailing in the same direction. And lately I've been thinking, I don't know that, that I see that happening. And that, where do you turn to? Then you turn to the civil disobedience and kind of the more, you know, outside the, the existing system, change the system rather than work within it. And I find myself- To Julia's point, I mean, I think, I think there is bipartisan potential for things not directly related to climate, but that have a big impact on climate, like the, the, the bill that Senator Murkowski and Manchin were working on. I think right. it's about taking our democracy back. Climate change is not the only issue that is getting the back burner when a public health crisis happens and there happens to be an election year at the same time. Let's go down the litany of things the entire country agrees on that our representatives don't act on, whether it's sensible measures for gun control that 90% of the population believes should be uh, embraced by their leaders or whether it's climate change, I'll remind us all there's an intergenerational transition of power underway in this country and across the world. And despite the fact that we have two 78 year old dudes running the country or potentially running the country, it's not all 78 year old people that are deciding things on the ground. And increasingly there is an appreciation of the uniformity of certain ideas like the threat of climate change, the threat of gun violence that is embraced by decision makers, people who have more and more authority, who are under 78 years old, who look at science and look at facts and act on those, as well as try to be responsive to a constituency that actually isn't polarized, even if the Senate or the White House or the national political climate might suggest is. Yeah, we've had a lot of food analogies on this show. Meanwhile, a lot of Americans just aren't eating right now. <laughs> They're waiting in lines and for hours and hours. There's a potential movement, mass movement that could happen here where people really want to see their voices expressed at this time of extreme pain and then become politically active in ways that they haven't before. So that could be one interesting way that this crisis starts to, you know, breed more activity across a range of issues.
We have to wrap it up, but I think, you know, I think, you know, we have to ask ourselves sometimes, you know, are we deluding ourselves if we think that incremental change within existing structures are going to, you know, bring about the magnitude of change that we, we know is, is, uh, is necessary. And I sometimes ask myself if I'm just, you know, have a uh, suffering from denial light by thinking that incremental policy change is going to get us there when the math is so, so dark, so stark. On Climate One today, we've been discussing the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on energy for fueling cars and airplanes and powering buildings and industry. We heard about the impacts on oil companies and workers and how the pandemic is perhaps brightening the prospects for wind, solar, and other renewable sources. Another winner today uh, out of this may be Saudi Arabia, which could emerge an economically and ge geopolitically stronger. I'm Greg Dalton. I'd like to thank our all-star panel of energy communicators. Jason Bordoff is founding director of the Center for Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Amy Harder, energy and climate reporter for Axios. And Scott Jacobs, CEO of Generate Capital, a developer of clean energy projects. And Julia Piper, co-host of the Political Climate Podcast. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available but wherever you get your pods, please help us get more people talking about climate by giving us a rating or review. It really does help. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time, everybody.